that, take a look at this. Well, Gold Creek, happy Super Swift Sunday. This is the day where they face off two opposing teams, the Usher fans and the Taylor Swift fans. Right? You're like, wait, there's also football. Yeah, we know, but come on. If the Seahawks aren't playing, do we really even care? Like, I know there's no Niner fans in here because this is a church. And most of the people love Jesus. And if there's Chiefs fans, you're just bandwagon. Okay, love you guys. Awesome. Listen, I am so excited to be here this weekend. It is uh, always a privilege to be with Gold Creek. But I have to tell you, uh, as a guest, it would be easy to tell you how amazing your pastor is. He's a great leader, a great preacher. He's quite honestly, I think, the smartest person that I know. Um, but better than that, the thing I could say is uh, he's one of my best friends in the entire world, a person of character and integrity. Dude, I love you so much. Uh, thankful for who you are. Would you help me honor your pastor, Nick Walstead, this morning? I also love doing that because I know how much he hates it. It's so much fun. Okay. Uh, this weekend, they uh, decided, hey, we're going to bring you in for a real hope-filled topic. It's going to be really exciting and encouraging. We're going to talk about anxiety. And I was like, like, you just feel it, right? Like, if you didn't uh, struggle with anxiety, when the video came on, it was cloudy with a chance of anxiety. You're like, I think I may now. Like, I'm, I'm interested, right? Um, I, I, I want to tell you this before we dive in is there is a sliver of anxiety that really could be qualified really as fear, fear of the unknown, uh, fear of the what ifs or what could be. And so that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, statistically, I want you to know this, that 33% of the American population deal with anxiety. Um, greater than 50% know someone who does currently deal with anxiety. So I say all that to say this. If you personally don't deal with anxiety, today you're in the best place you could possibly be for the people that you care about most in your life. Because we're going to talk about something that I think is not just something we experience culturally, but that the Bible has a lot to say about as well. But before we dive into that, I did some research for you guys to find out what are some of the phobias maybe you didn't know that were out there, and maybe now you'll have. Okay, you ready? The first one is this, it's called linonophobia. And that stands for fear of lines. That's right, fear of lines. Like if I go to Disney, I have that one, right? Or a fear of string. Um, here's another one, arachabatruhiaphobia, which stands for the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of one's mouth. I know. Um, Syngenisphobia? Uh, you have this around Thanksgiving and Christmas is the fear of one's relatives is what that is. <laughs> Could be turkey as well. Um, those are funny fears. Uh, there are some funny fears. There's also some not so funny fears, right? There's some fears that are just real in life, uh, such as um, height. Not height in general. I'm obviously not afraid of that. Um, five, nine. I mean heights, <laughs> Uh, or a fear of open water. If you know me at all, that you know that those are the two biggest fears I face in life, fear of heights and fear of open water. And several years ago, I was with a friend. We were living down in Ecuador, and um, he decided one day he wanted to take me to this tropical location called the Galapagos Islands. I was like, sign me up. Sounds dope. And he goes, hey, man, we'll go snorkeling. And then my idea of snorkeling is like, it's where you can stand up in the water and put your face in, right? It's like... Hmm, look how much clearer it is down here, you know? And instead, he's like, no, dude, we're gonna go snorkeling and we're gonna throw on like wetsuit and the whole gear and we're getting a boat. And I was kind of like, eh, okay. Uh, so he takes me to this place called Kicker Rock Island. I've got a picture for you. Um, this is where he took me to. And it looks beautiful, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Here's why. I don't know if you know this, but on Kicker Rock Island, you cannot touch any of the rock of Kicker Rock Island because it's fire barnacle, which means if you touch it, your skin will burn, which means you're in the open water looking at something that feel like you can get out of the open water, but you can't. 
yes, it's awful, right? And so this boat takes us down this little canal, this little passageway of Kicker Rock Island, and they allow us to jump in the water, and it's just me and my buddy, and uh, we're swimming around for a minute, and I was kind of like, ooh, kind of feeling a little funny, so I like look up, wanted to ask for somebody, something from the boat, and I look up, and the boat's gone. <sighs> Wetsuit got a lot wetter. I was like, no, what is happening right now? This is awful, right? But I'm like, I'm gonna endure. I'm gonna, like, hey, I got this, it's fine, right? And so put my face back in the water, swimming around, and don't touch the sides of the walls. And um, all of a sudden, I look down, and it's like, it's, it's kind of way down there, but guess what I see? I see a, yeah, look, you could have said fish, you could have said turtle. You knew exactly what I saw. I saw a shark. I see a shark, and listen, if you're like some sharkologist, don't meet with me after and be like, well, some sharks don't actually like to eat humans. Yes, they do. It's why it's called a shark, okay? So I see the shark, and I'm like, oh, this is awful. I pop up out of the water. I'm like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, I'm with my friend. He's much larger than I am. And so I was like, oh, you know what? Like, if it comes down to it, I don't outswim the shark. Just outswim him. But then I was also like, but maybe he can help me fight the shark. So I did what any good friend would do. I reached down, yank his like, goggles and his off. And um, dude, he starts, oh, he's like choking on water and drowning. I was like, well, dude, suck it up. Here, we got a problem. There's a shark. And he's like, what? And he puts on his goggles and he looks down. Well, about that time, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's a, no, it's a shark, right? And so... I'm like, this is awful. What am I going to do? And then I was like, well, do I just let the shark eat him? No, I'll alert him. So I, hey, dude, there it is. And he's like, what? So he puts his goggles on, he looks in the water, puts my face under the water, which I was like, oh, dude, he flipped the script. He's going to give me to the shark, right? Turns out it wasn't a shark at all. It was a beautiful sea lion. It was playing. It wanted to, yeah. It took me a minute to recover from that. We end up going on this journey. We swim all the way down Kicker Rock Island. We see sea turtles and fish and like funny looking flowers under the ocean. You know, we do all this stuff. And it dawned on me that day that if I'm not careful, I'll go through life similar to how I went snorkeling on Kicker Rock Island. I'll be so scared of the sharks that I'll miss all the beauty that was created. Listen, as we talk about anxiety today, I'm not an expert or clinical psychologist in anxiety. I have a master's degree in the area of ministry and theology. What I do have is an expertise, unfortunately, in the area of anxiety. See, since the age of 10 to 12, I have struggled with chronic and debilitating anxiety and depression. So I come to you today, not as someone who can tell you about how I just conquered it, but to tell you about somebody who's still fighting it. And so for those of you who deal with anxiety today, I want you to know you got a foxhole friend. You got somebody who's just saying, hey, we may not get over it, but we're gonna get through it together. Why? Because fear doesn't get to win and anxiety doesn't get to dictate the rest of my life. So today I wanna look at how do we fight fear? First, let me give you a categories for fear because I think this is important. These two categories for fear could be similar to categorizing anxiety. The first one is this, is that fear can be a good guide, a good guide. What do I mean by that? There's facilitating fear and there's debilitating fear. There is some fear that was given to you by God and you're like, that is wrong. No, listen, if a lion runs in the auditorium right now and tries to eat you, you should have a healthy enough fear to run. If you're like, no, I would pet it, you and I should talk after service, okay? Facilitating. In the same way, did you know that clinical psychologists would tell you there's facilitating anxiety? But so there's actually a part of you that gets anxious or on high alert in the right circumstances. Fear as a guide, but fear is a terrible God. Fear as a guide is a feeling I get. Fear as a God is something I function in, which means this, I don't just get to lead my feeling, my feeling begins to lead me. That's important for us to recognize the difference. Otherwise, we'll fight something in the wrong way. Scripture says it this way. Paul's writing to a young leader in the church, and he says this in 2 Timothy 1, 7. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of, oh, I like you, sir. Uh, God has not given us a spirit of, okay, we're gonna try one more time in a Super Bowl crowd. You're like, wrap it up. I will preach through the halftime show if you don't, okay, right? For God has not given us a spirit of fear. fear. He's ready for the halftime show, okay. Now, this is important 
Because it doesn't say you won't feel fear. So he's not giving you a spirit of fear, meaning something that would control my life. God has not given me a spirit that would control me or leave me in a place of fear and anxiety. But he has given me power, love, and a sound mind. Power, love, and a sound mind. Now, when we're in a room like this, in a building like this, with Jesus' people, it can be easy for us to begin to go, hey, there's some people in the room who have faith and some who don't. I believe that every single human being on this planet was hardwired for faith. I think sometimes there's a group of us who spell it differently, meaning this. Some of us have faith, F-A-I-T-H. You're like, man, he can spell, and I'm from Alabama, okay? Also, there are others of us who spell faith, F-E-A-R. You're like, well, that's an incorrect spelling, you all right? It's also an incorrect way of living. Here's what I mean by faith and fear. They are both in the direction of the unknown. When I have fear, it's of the unknown. It's what if, right? But faith has an unknown and says, even if, even if I go through hard things, I have a good God who promised he would never leave me or forsake me. I can have an even if heart instead of a what if mindset. What if it goes wrong? What if the person I don't like gets elected? What if the economy gets bad? What if inflation rises? What if my investments don't work out like I thought? You and I are given the ability by God to decide will we live a life led by fear or faith? Today, I've come to make the announcement, fear doesn't get to win. Fear doesn't get to win. Maybe you could do this for me this weekend. Just tap your neighbor real quick politely, say fear doesn't get to win. You're like, it just felt funny saying it. Here's why we need to say it, because sometimes we need to put words and accuracy behind the intentionality of our heart. This weekend, simply declaring fear doesn't get to win is one thing. Leaning into a path and a plan is another. I want to give you just a couple of things this weekend from the Old Testament that I believe will help us Make that declaration a destination in our life. Fear doesn't get to win. In the Old Testament, there's this group of people known as the Israelites, God's chosen people. In the book of Judges, we see that God's chosen people choose to follow him and then fall away, choose to follow him and fall away. So God keeps raising up leaders to relieve them from the oppression of other people. Well, the Midianites have been raiding the Israelites' farms and land and people for about seven years, and God speaks to a man named Gideon. He speaks to a man named Gideon, he's raising him up as a leader. First point this weekend, if we're going to declare fear doesn't get to win, is simply this. I've got to fight fear in my head. I've got to fight the fear in the battle of my head. You know what I've come to find is the enemy's battle lines are often behind my eyelids, right here. And you'll never get the enemy from above you and ruling over you if I don't get him from out from inside my head. What do I mean by that? We see in the life of Gideon in Judges chapter six and verse 11, it says the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah. And some of you, when you first read it, you're like, oh, Oprah was in the Bible? It's Ophrah, okay? Now you're like thinking about all the old sitcoms and uh, you're like, Jerry Springer, how's he doing? No, Come back to the table, ADD, okay? That my own ADD. All right. That belonged to Joash the Abazarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, this is important. This passage for us can just seem like minor details, but to the actual writer and the early readers, this is important because as a cultural context, you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You can't thresh wheat in a wine press successfully. Threshing wheat would require you to throw it up in the air. It would separate the wheat from the chaff, and you would have this ability to do that, and it would fall to the floor. A wine press is a place of crushing of grapes. It wasn't built for the right thing. It goes on and says in this, said the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, you and I would have looked at Gideon and said, the Lord is with you, average farmer. God comes in through the angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Talking to a guy who's in the middle of fear, who's hiding away, just trying to get by on the scraps, simply going like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna be okay. I don't know what's gonna happen. 
The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And of course, Gideon hears that and responds, you got it, God. I'm your guy. No. Gideon responds with this, pardon me, my Lord. I mean, that's the accent that I give Gideon in this passage. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, doesn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Highlight that circle in your brain. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord. Ask Gideon, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. Gideon says, I'm the worst of the worst. I'm not a warrior, I'm weak. Fear will lie to us, and fear will always send my headspace to the wrong place, always. Fear will always give me the ability to write a story, a narrative, a chapter that doesn't actually exist. Have you ever, 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 ever in your life woken up in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you see across the room a person standing in the corner of your room. Like, what? What are they doing there? You finally get up the courage to go flip on the light switch, and you flip on the light switch, and what do you see? A jacket you hung up the night before, right? <laughs> Speaking from experience, it happened last night to me in my hotel. I, was, I woke up in the middle of the night. I'm like, somebody broke into my room. They partnered with the count, counter person. They got a key to my room. They're here to kill me. It was my clothes I laid out for myself this morning, right? Why? Because fear, fear will create a narrative. It happens. Listen, we know this neurologically, that there are neurons that fire together, wire together. If I live into this same synapsis of fear long enough, then what do I do? I begin to think that the not yet is actually already the not evidence is actually real. If I'm not careful, fear will send my headspace to the wrong place. Sends Gideon to a wine press to thresh wheat. Where has fear sent you? Can I tell you some places fear has sent me? Isolation. Isolation. Fear of what other people thought about me. Fear of failing. Fear. A lot of fear will send us to the wrong place. Friend, we can fight fear by choosing to change the narrative. The second thing that fear will do is fear will stop me from seeing who God really is, who God really is. Gideon says to the angel of the Lord, if God's with us, why has all this bad happened? I remember because of pain, trauma, and tragedy in my own life from the ages of 10 to 12, that one of the things that fear and anxiety did in my teenage years to begin to shape a narrative about who God was that wasn't true of his character, that God didn't care, he wasn't close, or he couldn't love me. Oh, fear began to shape and change who God was. If this bad happened to me, then God must be bad. Listen to me, friends. If we only take our cues from a broken world, we'll believe lies about a good God. If we only take cues from a broken world. If we look at the world around us and go, it's broken, God must be broken. No, 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 no. I look at a broken world and go, there is brokenness in humanity, but I have a faith or trust in God that he's redeeming, renewing, and restoring all things back to him. That's my hope. How do you lean into who God really is? I love that we're doing this 40 days of spiritual growth. Here's the reason why. It's because in 40 days of spiritual growth, there's gonna be two elements that you encounter. Number one is prayer. Prayer reminds me of the closeness of God. Number two is the Bible. That reminds me of the character of God. One of the things that I need when I'm dealing with anxiety personally is a centering point to help my mind see what is the real evidence. What is fear? Fear is, I've heard it said, false evidence as appearing real, but as you become an adult, it just becomes flawed evidence because the enemy knows you won't fall for a full out lie, so it'll just skew the truth a little. Oh yeah, there's a God, but does he really love you? Oh, I know he loves humanity, but does he love you? Does he care about you? When I get in the word of God and learn the character of God, I go, wait, God's near to the brokenhearted. Wait, he's faithful yesterday, today, and forever. Wait, he's beginning and end. He'll be with me in the middle. When I learn about the character of God, I can trust the closeness of God. That's the power of prayer. If it doesn't change how I see God, fear will stop me from seeing who I really am or who we really are. This is key for you and I. Fear will stop us from seeing who we are. You will 
define yourself by your bad decisions. You will define yourself by your background, your ancestry, your, your degrees, your DNA, all of the things that God does not define you by. God doesn't define Gideon by even his past performance. He shows up and says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. He has never warred anything. God defines you by his purposes, not by your past. See, anxiety and fear will take me back to my past and out of fear of repeating cycles or circumstances cause me to live into a definition of somebody that I no longer am. This weekend, you can fight fear because you can actually win in the area of the battle of your mind. Number two is this, is I've got to fight fear by winning the battle in my home. This is key for every person who's in a, a relationship, maybe that's parental, familial, spousal, romantic. I need you to understand that we don't fight alone. We don't fight alone. And I mean that in two ways. Number one is, yes, we fight together. We fight for each other, but I also have to recognize that my kids are watching the fight that I have. Listen, we're very vulnerable and authentic in our family. We have discussions around the areas of anxiety, fear. We talk about our emotions. Listen, if you're a dude in the room, let me just set the record straight. When people say men don't cry, it's a lie. Men cry. Men are real about their feelings. Men are vulnerable. Men are authentic about what's taking place inside of them instead of letting it boil up and take over them. Amen? Oh, come on. A couple of guys, you can say amen a little bit stronger than that. I think it's important as men that we take our cues about manliness from Jesus. Jesus is the one who could flip over tables and still weep over the death of a friend. We can be moved with compassion. As men, it's important for us to be authentic. How do we fight the battle in our home? I love what happens in the book of Judges, chapter six, verse 25 through 27. God tells Gideon, you gotta go tear down some idols that are in your household that your family built up because they thought that that would protect them or relieve them or bring them prosperity and help their crops grow. Listen, you're gonna have to tear that down. And it says this, but because he was afraid of the family and townspeople, he did it at night rather than daytime. Now you could look at this and go like, Man, Gideon's still weak. Ah, I go, he's a strategic warrior. That's what I feel like. He's strategic. Listen, I'm not telling you to win the battle in your home that you go in and you just like sit your whole family down today and you're like, you tell me, have you ever dealt with fear or anxiety? No one wants it. Yes, I am now. That made me very anxious, right? No, what I am saying though is how you pray and the consistent character and closeness that you display with God, that consistency brings credibility with those in your family and relationships. See, it's important for me as a father. Although I battle anxiety, it's important for my kids to see me still fight, to see me still fight, to see me still war, to see me still go, I can't just have anxiety attacks. I can actually attack anxiety. Actually, I can actually battle back. How do we do that? Well, I think it's important that we not only share our weaknesses, but we combine our strengths. I think sometimes we can get in this religious routine or habit where we ask this question like, will you pray for me? Right? And we think it's a noble thing. Like, will you pray for me? What I've decided to do with my kids is we don't pray for each other. We pray with each other. Here's the difference. One would be like, we go to the gym together. And sir, you get in there and you do all the work. You're doing push-ups and stuff. And I go, huh, I don't feel sore at all. We'd all. You'd all look at me like, well, duh, because you didn't do the work. Sometimes we gotta flex our faith with each other. There's something about doing it together as a family. So when my kids see me go through anxiety, what they also see dad do is fight. We started doing these affirmations in our family. We would try to make sure we're building each other up and encouraging each other. And then we also put in nighttime prayers. I do them every single night, every night. Doesn't matter how many passionate disagreements my wife and I have had, fights. Doesn't matter how much struggle it's been to get the boys to bed. It's like, hey, we're gonna do nighttime prayers. We, we've done that consistently so we can help them understand we're gonna lead our lives in the area of gratitude because we're gonna fix our thoughts on Jesus. When we fix our thoughts on Jesus, we stop worrying about some of the secondary stuff that we don't yet know about. So that means sometimes my kids will come to me on the days where I don't wanna to talk to anybody. Like, I'm done, I'm done peopling. I've talked to everybody and anybody about everything and anything. I don't wanna to talk to anybody else. My son Braxton will come in, hey, nighttime prayers. 
Sometimes I'm like, you got him, bro. <laughs> you pray. He, God, thank you for my family. Thank you, and he'll name every person in the family. Names the dogs too, right? Sometimes names them and doesn't his brother. Got to put him in. Go through the whole thing. God, thank you for a great night's sleep. This is important. And you may go, well, James, like, pff, you probably, you know, you probably got a good life. I have a blessed life. Doesn't mean it's easy. Listen, sometimes we separate the stage from the seat and we act like it's a huge chasm when it's only separated by a few feet. Here's the reality. My family, we just moved. We felt like it was our, our purpose and mission to move to Denver, Colorado. So we moved from Tampa, Florida to Denver, Colorado. And in doing that, there was a lot of unknowns. We actually ended up living in a hotel for about three months. And when I say hotel, you're like, man, probably like the Ritz and you had like a maid and cleaning. No, 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 like halfway house vibes. Like, no lie, one day we smelled something burning, so I went down to the front desk. I was like, excuse me, you think there's a fire on the fourth floor? I, oh, no, it's Frank. Wait, you know who's doing that? Yeah, he checks in like once or twice a month, cooks up some meth, and then he leaves. I was like, whoa, he what? We know this is happening? Guess what we did every night? Every night while we lived in that hotel. God, thank you for my family. Thank you for a great night. You don't know why? Consistency brings credibility. I don't want to just win in my head and not win in my home. It's important for us to fight fear by winning the battle in our home. Number three, you've got to fight fear by winning the battle in my circle. My circle, my community, my friendships. Now, what's interesting is Gideon, this warrior who's never war, is getting ready to go to war. And so he amasses this huge army. And God has a strategy that's always different than human strategy. It says in Judges chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian in their hands, or Israel would boast against me and say, my own strength has saved me. Now announce the army. Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, Still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. They were outnumbered 450 to one. And God says, that's ah, too many. You go, Jace, what does that have to do with me and my friends? It may be God's protection and not rejection that has thinned out some of the friendships of your life. Listen, people that are around you and people that are for you are two different things. It's important for you and I to have people that aren't just around us in our circle of friends, but are really for us. What do I mean by for you? I don't mean just for your enjoyment. I mean for your purpose. When I tell you that Pastor Nick's a, a great friend of my life, I mean he's part of my circle. He's somebody that when I'm fearing failure that I can go to, around the age of 17, if you don't know my story, homeless, living out of the back of a Ford Explorer, abusing prescription drugs and alcohol. Several months ago, I had a wreck while living in Denver, Colorado. Got through the wreck, sent my car to the tow yard. One of the first people I called was Pastor Nick. And here's why. Not just to pray for my healing. I called him and said, hey man, I'm afraid that I got enough pain that I'll go to the doctor and I'll get a script. And I don't need one. I don't need one. I'm telling you right now, my body's okay. I need you to call and keep me accountable. I need you to call my wife and find out if I've gone to the doctor, if I'm getting any prescriptions. Why? Because I know that I can fight fear by bringing the dark thing into the light. You want a circle that's so for you that you can bring your greatest fear to them and they fight with you, not against you. You know what he didn't do? He didn't go, wow, bro, really? You're a pastor. Get it together. No. He said, hey, man, I'll do that. He said, I'm gonna call you back tomorrow. And the next day, he called several times, the first several weeks, checking in. You know what I never did? I never, dude, why are you calling? No, because true circle of friendship is more committed to your purpose than your pleasure. I need somebody in my life who's going, I'll help you fight those fears. There's some other fears like, how many of you know the term FOMO? How many of you know FOMO? Raise your hand. Oh, we'll keep talking about it for those who don't know. Okay, so FOMO, it's very crazy, and some people have it and some people don't, and um, truthfully, it's called the fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. You ever felt like that? Like, I don't want to miss anything. And that's one thing about a circle. There's some interesting one I felt, though. There's faux faux. It's a truer one. It's the fear of failing others. See, if I allow fear to win in my circle, I never tell Pastor Nick, and guess what? The temptation gets to live on in my life. Or what about this? The phobi, fear of being irrelevant. 
I'm so worried about my position in life, my prestige, who I am, that I stop being authentic and vulnerable. And guess what? People can never fight for the fake you. They need to fight for the real you. What would it like for you and I to fight fear by winning the battle in our circle? The last thing, and I'm getting ready to close, is point four. Fight fear by winning the battle in my assignment. What's interesting about these points is you can actually take them in reverse. Is as you win the battle in your head, your home, your circle, your assignment, there'll come a time in your life where you go, wait, my assignment determines my circle. It tells me how we function in my home, and it's a reminder for my headspace. Gideon has this moment. He goes from weak warrior to living into his God-given assignment. It says in Judges chapter 7 and 17, watch me, he told them, follow my lead when I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do, and when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the count, blow yours, shout for the Lord and for Gideon. You know what's encouraging about this? Is Gideon has this realization that he's built different. Do you know you're built different? There's something different about you. Gideon taps into a strength he didn't know he had. He was reminded at some point what, what God said to him. He said, go in the strength you have. Go in the strength you want? No. Go in the strength you see other people have? No. Go in the strength you have. James, I don't feel like I got strength. I didn't consult your feelings today. I consult the truth. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given you a spirit of, but what is the strength he has given us? Power, love, and a sound mind. A sound mind, peace in the midst of any circumstance. Peace in the midst of chaos. All this weekend, I need you to know there's a strength you may not know you have. Listen, diagnosis doesn't get to win in your life. A mental illness doesn't get to win in your life. We serve the creator of everything in this universe. He put the stars in the sky. He made the sun come up in the morning and the moon rise at night. If he did all of that, don't you think he's concerned with you and I? Oh, this weekend, this weekend, do I still deal with anxiety? Look at me, yes. I'd love to be the one that came in today and go, Hey, I'm an expert on how to cure anxiety. I'm not. I'm not. I wish I could come in and say, I'm the one who beat anxiety. That's not me yet. What I have come to find is I have a God who's with me, though. And if he's with me, I may not be over it. But guess what, sucker? I'm getting through it. I'm getting through it. Day by day, I'm hanging on to a strength that I have that's not based on my performance, it's based on his presence. That's why I get in prayer. Not so I can just feel better, so I can function better. When I get in prayer or I get in the word, what I'm reminded of is I'm not alone and there is a strength that I have that is beyond what I feel. Today, that's not just me. That's not a pastor's story, it's your story. For every single person who claims to follow Jesus, you got a strength that you may not know you have. It's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you. And today you get to tap into that. That power, that love, that peace passes all understanding. Listen, I still got a counselor and a psychologist. I still got a community and a support group. All of those things are real. You can have a therapist and Jesus too. I've come to find that God for me is the most consistent strength in my life to battle in the area of anxiety. If you're a follower of Jesus, I'm gonna pray for you in a moment. That this week you take a step of faith in the face of fear. But some of you are here today and you go, James, I've not made a decision to follow Jesus yet. I wanna give you a very brief explanation of the gospel. Every human being is dead in sin until we receive the good gift God sent us. God so loved you and I, he sent his son Jesus to live the life we couldn't. He was perfect, never sinned, never mistaked, never fell short. And then he was, he was killed, murdered, laid down his life, died the death we deserve because of our own sin. But he was raised to new life to prove nothing could stop God's love for you. He wasn't a good man, he was the God man. And his resurrection proves everything we need to know about the power of God today. All you have to do is say, I'm choosing to trust in Jesus. I'm following him. And when you do that, that same spirit that I just told all these people lives in them, you become a Jesus person, and now that spirit lives in you. 
you got a strength that's available to you today. I'm gonna ask you all over this room, in just a moment, would you stand with me? I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. As you stand, front to back, left to right, you're here today. First group of people, you say, James, that's me. I need to say yes to Jesus today for the first time or the first time in a long time. This is your moment. You don't have to wait till you know it all. You'll never know everything. You're trusting, having faith in the unknown, faith in God's work in your life, and you're receiving the good gift of Jesus. If that's you, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to slip your hand up. You can put it right back down. One, two, three, right now. Yeah, I see you, come on, bro. Yeah, 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 come on. Wow, there are hands going up everywhere. Church with eyes closed. Would you just celebrate all those who just made that decision? My goodness. Before you open your eyes, I'm, and I pray, the second group of people, you're a Jesus person, but you've not tapped into that fighter spirit. You've not tapped into that power. And today you go, James, I need the Holy Spirit inside of me to give me that power to face, to fight. That's you. Just raise your hand right now all over this room. Come on, I'm gonna pray. God, I thank you that you're here, that you're real. You're not far off, you're close. And today, because of your son Jesus, so many people are choosing to trust and follow you. I pray they would never be the same. Your Holy Spirit would fill their life. And the fruit of that would be power, love, and peace in their mind. And for my friends today, in this place, who are your followers? Today, they need that Holy Spirit on the inside of them to bring that power, I pray. This week, they would experience what a sound mind and true peace look like. I pray they would fight the battle in their head, their home, their circle. And what they would find is you have a great purpose and assignment for their life. Pray all these things in the name above every name, the name of our hope and liberating King, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Hey, I'm gonna ask you to do something, Gold Creek, a little different this weekend. I'm gonna ask you to wait just a moment. Don't slip out, don't try to beat the rush. Let's spend a moment. One of the ways you fight anxiety is you war in worship. You war in worship. Worship is a prayer that I sing back to God. Today, we're actually singing a song from, from my church in Denver, Colorado. It's called Good Plans. It's a reminder that God's a good shepherd and that fear doesn't get to win and that if he's a good shepherd, that he has good plans for my life. Today, whether you sing it or not, maybe you just receive that prayer. And the second thing I want you to do is this. Is I got people on my left and my right at the crosses right now. They're there wa waiting not to pray for you, but to pray with you. If you're a part of that second group of people and you raise your hand, you're like, man, I'm fighting anxiety. I'm asking, no, I am triple dog daring you this weekend, Gold Creek Church, not to just sit in a seat and worry about what everybody else thinks, because guess what? Freedom doesn't care what everybody thought about me. I dare you to go get prayer, pray with some people today, build that circle and fight for the purpose that God has for your life. Can we do that this morning? Come on, let's sing this song together. We're gonna declare that God has good plans. He's a good shepherd for our lives. Love you, Gold Creek. You can go ahead and uh, go receive prayer if you need it as we're gonna continue to worship.
He has good plans. He has good plans for me, for you, for your friends, for your family. This is a message that people need to hear. The great news about today is that A, you can share the message. People watching online, I got friends watching online right now, out of state, tune in. But also we have resources. First, a 40 day prayer. The spiritual walk challenge there, hey, it's on our website. I encourage you, go check it out. Even if you grab the paper, go check it out so you can have it on your phone with you. But also there's a bunch of resources on there for anxiety and other things that, that maybe you need, but maybe you don't, but somebody near you might. So you can share that. As we finish this part of the song, I just wanna remind you, there's the prayer team members there as well as online, wherever you may be. If you need to leave, you can leave. They're gonna finish this song out. If you wanna walk over and get be prayed with or just be quiet with the Lord, I encourage you to do that. Let's continue to worship. You're dismissed if you need to leave.